Aloha kako, and welcome to the premiere episode of Long Story Short. I'm Leslie Wilcox. We hope that PBS Hawaii's newest television program entertains, informs, and perhaps even inspires you through conversations with some of the most interesting people in our community. And through our website at pbshawaii.org, you're invited to take part in our program. Log on and see who some of our upcoming guests are. Suggest questions for them and make suggestions for other people you'd like to see featured on Long Story Short. Your involvement in our programs and support of our mission will help us to make our community even more diverse, informed, and perhaps even inspired. We're about to sit down with Kelly E. Reichel, an icon in the Hawaiian music and culture scene. But in this conversation, we'll try to draw out the character behind the musician, chanter, and kumuhula. How do you define yourself? Songwriter, kumuhula, <laughs> recording artist? Uh, I'm Hawaiian. First, for me, personally, first and foremost, I'm Hawaiian. And so I try to do things that um, connect myself to my ancestors, um, my kupuna, um, and uh, find my, my, my way today through my music, through chant, through hula. Um, I, think, I think that's first and foremost, and everything else just happens, I think. I recall reading a, a while back that you were, you were surprised when you had these hit songs because you never considered yourself a good singer. No, and I think uh, I, I think most singers don't think they can sing. I, I, I know I can hold a tune, uh, but I'm not sure that I would uh, go see me in concert. <laughs> but uh, no, I I. I, I I'm thankful for what we have, and I'm thankful for the gifts that, are, that were bestowed, bestowed upon um, us. And so we try to utilize them as best as we can without um, being too pushy about it, you know, so. Are you a perfectionist? Yes. Uh, I, we rehearse lots. We, we do a lot of um, practicing, making sure that um, songs are correct, the, the chords are correct, the language is correct, um, the ano or the the, the feeling is correct um, as much as possible. Because, you know, people are, you know, especially if they're coming to see you in concert or at a performance, you know, they're, they, they're paying money to come see you. Um, you know, you don't want to disappoint and you want to make sure that um, people leave happy and you know, worth their time um, to come and see you. Are so, you tougher on yourself or other people? Probably. Um, maybe a little bit of both, depending. I think um, um, we try to pick and choose um, those of those who are around us um, who have the same kind of mindset, you know, where excellence is um, up here. We try to reach that. We're never going to reach it. We're never going to be perfect. But at least we have something to strive for um, every single time. You yeah. mentioned to me before we got started here that this situation is a little odd for you because mm -hmm. as a kumuhula, you like to be in charge and in control, and this TV setting is, is not quite your way of doing things. Yeah, it's a, it's a little um, different, <laughs> for lack of a better word. But, um, you know, insofar as, you know, being a kumuhula, um, we are responsible for everything to do with the education of our students when it comes to the hula. And when you think about the hula, you know, um, there's there's so many different parts of um, our cultural fabric that's in in the hula itself. You know, within the hula, you have language, you have gesture, you have dance, you have mindset, uh, poetry. You know, and within all of that, you have little sub things like history and um, uh, uh, cultural aspects like um, different kinds of practices you know, fishing, farming, uh, kapa making, all, everything comes under um, that particular umbrella of, that we know of as hula. So it's not just dance. And, and so when you're kumuhula, we believe that you are the singular source for your particular um, brand or, or thought process of, I shouldn't say brand, thought process of hula. Um, and so you have to be strong. You have to make sure that your students um, follow um, everything to the letter as best as you can because that's what our kupuna did. Yeah, it's how, how I teach is how I learned. Not a democracy. Absolutely not. Yeah, yeah. If we say jump, you ask how high. You know, that kind. But and you feel comfortable with that being the, the, the source of all the, you know, the 
the direction. Yes, yes, be and, and because I started with that, you know, this singing thing, as I like to call it sometimes, because sometimes it's, you know, it just happens, um, is it actually came out of my hula training and out of my oli training and chant training. Uh, so yeah, so that's always where I'm gonna go back to no matter what. Because I know that this career, for lack of a better word, is, you know, it's fleeting, it can be. You know, these things don't last forever, but our culture is much more grounded than that. Yeah, that is where I derive, we derive a lot of our strength and um, inspiration. When you say we, are, is it the royal we or halal yeah, we know, or your... I get asked that a lot, you know, um, I don't like to use the word I. And so sometimes it's kind of weird when I say we, because it sounds like the world we, but it's, it's just, it's an uncomfortable thing for me just to say I, so, so kalamai if it sounds weird. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I hear through the Coconut Wireless that you began life as a kid named Carlton. Mm-hmm, yep, that's my English name, Carlton Lewis Kelly Inani Aimoku Kalani Raichel. How did you become Kelly Raichel much in demand recording artist and performer? I don't know. Uh, I, I don't think you start off anything in your life with that kind of thing in mind. Um, maybe some people might, but I know that we didn't. Um, you know, oftentimes for us, and I can only speak for myself, you know, we work, we work at bettering our, our chant, our hula, learning about our language, you know, and you, as you move along on this particular path and you affect others and you teach and you learn yourself, and it's a give and take process. Um, uh, every once in a while you look up and you see what, what has happened and some people go, ah, yeah, yeah, good for you. And you know, that kind of thing. And you get all these accolades and stuff, but you know, we just put our head back down and go back to work. Uh, so I don't know how we got here. All I know is that we're here and uh, we do what we can while we're here. There's, there's some adversity in your background. You went to prison. Um, almost, not quite, almost. We, uh, um, I, I used to hang out with a group of people that we were very competitive. And um, it's probably part of my personality where you know, I always have to um, strive yeah, to be the best at what you do. And so long story short, uh, I was uh, convicted of um, grand theft yeah, when I was in my mid-20s, I think. What did you do? Um, took some money um, from the company that I was working for. And uh, Why did you do it? Uh, why? Let's see. In our little group, um, it started off small. It started off with, you know, taking a pencil and then a pen and then something, it just escalated. And so it was a little, it was a little competition between all of us and I had to be better. And so mine was the biggest one. Grand you know? theft, that means what, $250 or more, Oh right? yeah, I guess so, I don't know. Um, but, uh, you know, I was um, convicted. And it, the, the interesting thing was, you know, at the time I was living with my grandmother and, and I was kind of known on Maui as a kumuhula and, or, or at least an advocate of, of cultural, Hawaiian cultural things. And uh, I received a phone call from my, uh, at my grandmother's house from the investigating uh, detective. And he said, um, I'd like to come and, you know, I'd like for you to come and talk to us um, in Lahaina. I'm like, okay. So we went to I went to Lahaina and... Uh, you weren't scared? Like, oh, oh. I kind of knew. Yeah. I kind of knew. And so I got there and immediately was arrested. And so I sat down with him and he was an, uh, he knew my family. He knew that I was living with my grandmother. He didn't want my grandmother um, to see this at all. And so we sat down and um, he, uh, after I signed all the papers that I had to, he said, okay, you can go home and we will contact you. I was very lucky. Uh, a few months later, uh, I had to go to court and the judge at the time uh, was again familiar with my work as a kumuhula and so was the prosecutor and they were very very uh, um, staunch supporters of what I was doing even though they had to you know uh, punish me for what I had done and so they felt that it would be better if I stayed out of prison um, and worked towards bettering myself uh, culturally than actually going to prison. So that was a huge turning point for me.
Was that community service in lieu of prison time? Yeah, yeah. And I had to pay all the money back, you know. And I, and I speak freely about it because um, if, if I can provide one example of what you can do, how you can change your life, and it was because of the things that I was doing within the uh, Hawaiian community that prevented me from going to prison. Uh, I had to, in my mind, um, turn around and, and pay back. Uh, and from, it was from that point forward that it became even more imperative for me to um, strive for you know, cultural excellent, excellence as much as I could. So yeah, that was a huge turning point for me. Overcoming adversity, that seems to be a prerequisite for success in the music industry. And Keely E. Reichel undoubtedly has found success as a composer, performer, and teacher. We'll ask him what he thinks about being Hawaiian, being creative, and being a celebrity, next. Get interactive with Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox. Log on to pbshawaii.org and connect to Long Story Short to see who's scheduled to appear in upcoming episodes. Submit questions for them and submit suggestions for future guests. Get involved and get interactive with pbshawaii.org. Well, you think your life would be, have been different if you if you didn't get uh, Maybe. caught? Maybe. Maybe. Uh, I, I think so. Um, you know, if I hadn't gotten caught, I probably would have done more. Um, who knows? I, I really don't know. But I think, um, again, in retrospect, you get to, you know, if you're lucky enough, you get to look back on that path that you took and all the paths that you could have taken. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think I did the right thing at the right time or the wrong thing at the right time. You know, you say you are first and foremost in your life a Hawaiian. Mm -hmm. So traditional Hawaiian roots very important, but you, you live and you succeed in a contemporary society. How do you bridge the two worlds? Uh, I don't know. I, I, I think, you know, again, it's like one of those things, you don't work at bridging the two worlds, you just work at survival and being uh, as um, comfortable in your own skin and in your culture as possible. Uh, and I think that's it, really. Um, you know, I enjoy electricity. I enjoy <laughs> my TV, but I also enjoy waking up and doing ceremony, um, doing protocol, uh, um, reliving and reviving and re-articulating um, um, Hawaiian things, either through, through the chant or hula or whatever the case might be. Um, I think it's. Uh, being comfortable in your own skin and and just doing it. You express your creativity through music, through mm -hmm. the hula. Do you do art? Do you do creative writing as well? Oh, I wish I could draw, <laughs> but I can't. Uh, you could do your own album covers if you choose. <laughs> um, I I no, I don't I don't do a lot of that. I most of my creativity is it really is um, channeled or uh, funneled through the hula itself. I think that's imperative for Kumuhula to be creative. That's what we do. We create. We create um, new avenues in which to plug back into our um, history and, and to meld ourselves with our kupuna and to make it viable for today. That's what Kumuhula do. Um, that's their creative process. Uh, and they will always be doing that. Every generation of Kumuhula will bring their experiences of that particular time to the forefront. Couple that with uh, their training. And their training usually comes from, not always, but most of the time, comes from a long line of Kumuhula. And so those particular gestures, those particular thought processes um, always break through. Um, to the modern world through that particular person, through that kumuhula. So yeah, I, for, me, for myself and, and for many other kumuhula, that's, that's our creativity. And everything else is kind of gets, um, it's like shrapnel, <laughs> uh, for lack of a better word. And so the singing thing is kind of like shrapnel almost for me because it was through the hula and through chant and that particular training that the singing kind of branched out of. You know, as I listen to you, you don't seem caught up in the recording artist, celebrity part of it all. You really are into the, the hula and the halal part of it, aren't you? Yeah, I'm actually uncomfortable with um, um, 
this kind, you know. <laughs> um, but I, uh, there, there are certain people, there are certain times that I think it's important, um, and this is one of them. And so we, um, you know, you're right. We're not we're not comfortable. We're not caught up. And I think once you get caught up in it, um, it becomes a dangerous wave to ride. Um, it becomes distractive. And I think that you know whatever success we've had with this singing career. Um, happened in a later time in my life. Um, I think I was 32 when this happened. And so I already went through the evil 20s, you know. <laughs> I, got, I got a lot of that stuff out during that um, particular time. I think, on a personal level, had this success happened when I was 21, 22, 23, I think it would be different. Um, and so I'm thankful for that. And you don't seem to have trouble saying, uh, no, that's a great opportunity, but I don't want to do that. I mean, I've heard a lot of people say, oh, it's really hard to get Kelly E. Rochelle. He's tough to get. Right. Um, you, you can't say yes. We learned early on after the first or second year of this that you cannot say yes to everything. You have to build parameters around, around what it is that you're going to do. Um, Even though you're asked to do a lot of good things. Right. Yeah, and everything is good. That's the thing. Everything is good. But once you start to spread yourself thin, um, I'm going to quote something. It's, it's, you feel like um, too little bit butter on a large piece of bread. You know, you get spread so thin that it doesn't taste good anymore. And so you want that butter. I like butter, yeah. So butter, butter <laughs> got to be thick and right on top of that piece of bread. And so, uh, yeah. And so we've learned to build parameters to say, to say no and to say yes to the things that are important. Because otherwise, you become useless to the ones that you want to help if you're doing too many things. Especially in this community in Hawaii, it's a small community, and you know you only have so many venues to perform, um, and you can only perform so many times. You know, after a while, it becomes um, too much. Your island is, uh, is, is the first island I think of when I think of uh, a lot of newcomers with new ways and and uh, different expectations. Um, like how you mean? Transplants. Okay. You're correct. Yeah, the demographic is changing. And the demographic the changed probably for Maui earlier than other islands. Yeah, and, and actually it's, it's still different, very different. Um, is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Can you work with this? <laughs> well, we have no choice. Yeah, that's the thing. Um, it's difficult because you see things changing right before your eyes um, and very, very quickly on Maui. You know, um, a lot of you know, local people from neighbor islands, you know, they, they criticize Honolulu, the city. Oh, it's the city, and all the traffic and the freeways. But, you know, if you look at it, if you look at Oahu as a whole, um, you still have these old neighborhoods that have mom and pop stores. There's lots of them on this island. Um, mom and pop restaurants where the, wait, where the waitresses are grouchy, you know, and you get, um, you know, fat and gristle in your saimin, you know, that kind of stuff. And that is almost all gone on Maui, you know, because it's a different kind of um, movement. It's a different kind of, uh, lack of a better word, maybe progress, I'm, I, I'm not sure. It's, a, it's difficult to see and difficult to be around sometimes, um, but you have no choice. You have to work with it and stand your ground um, when you have to. And some people don't like it. They, they think that it's either um, unwelcoming or it's even racist. So what does it mean to stand your ground? Stand your ground meaning, um, you know, that this is how we do things here. This is, this is our mindset, you know. Um, we, you know, I wouldn't presume to go anywhere else in the world and change how that community thinks. Yeah, because that's not my job. Yeah, my job is to meld into the community. And um, there, there are, you know, and I'm sure it happens all over the world, and there are people that just can't meld. They just want to make it how they want to make it. And that happens... Oh kind of often on Maui. It's just different, yeah. Sentiments that probably resonate throughout Maui and all of Hawaii's diverse communities. Coming up, Kill E. Rochelle tells us what he does to stay grounded and keep his focus. PBSHawaii.org is your online resource for program schedules and information on PBS shows and local productions. Log on and connect to Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox to download transcripts from this and all episodes. Get online and get interactive at pbshawaii.org. One of our PBS Hawaii viewers has a question for you. Rot roll. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 
When you need to recharge uh, your creativity, mm -hmm. what do you do? Where do you go? I stay home and I work in the yard. And where's home and what is your yard like? Well, I live up in Piholo. Um, Which is up country, Up country, Maui? up, up. It's, uh, it's in the Ahupua, uh, it's in the moku of Hamakua Poko. And um, it's about 3,500 feet above sea level, so it's kind of cold. And, uh, you know, I do a lot of yard work. As much as I can while I'm home anyway. You know, motor lawn, we yeah, get four dogs. Uh, uh, we d I just planted, you know, 40 um, ohia trees on the property. So, you know, all those, and I have kalo and uwala and all of those kinds of things. So, um, for me, I if I'm getting just a little bit too bombarded with this kind of uh, work, lifestyle, um, it always feels good to go back and get your hands dirty. And it, I had to clean my fingernails before I came because I didn't realize my fingernails were so dirty. Before I got here, I was like, hey, brah, just clean your nails. Um, but yeah, that's, where, that's how I recharge. And where do you get the strength from to, to go on? I mean, because we've talked about how people in the public eye tend to get criticism or you get people pulling you on different sides. How do you find strength? Uh, you find, I think there's a lot of different ways you can find that, and for everyone it's different. Um, I have a great family. Um, uh, I have really um, a small, very, very, very small group of um, close-knit friends. Uh, you know, halal keeps you grounded um, because you are responsible for so many people that you can't be, you know, flitting around too much, and you have to be grounded. Um, your students are a direct reflection off of you, so you have to make sure that you are strong enough for them to be able to um, be grounded because of you. Yeah, so that, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of stuff. I don't think it's just one thing. Um. And uh, now you're releasing a high-definition DVD. Is that a new creative challenge for you? A little bit. Uh, uh, you know, when we do our, uh, every year we have a show, we have a, uh, a three or four, con th three concerts on Maui, and we've been doing it for a few years. And it has become the venue in which not only to, um, for us to be, to sing, and, and for our fans or for those who like our music to come and watch us sing, but also it becomes a, an avenue for our halal um, um, to perform. And because that's part of the learning process, that's part of the cultural learning process, is learning how to um, get on a stage, learning how to take your craft that you learn in, your, in, in, um, in class and actually bring it to fruition in real time. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a huge part of learning for Halal. And so these concerts become um, that avenue for us. And, and we, we, do, we, we do interesting stuff. We, we try to bring in as much modern technology um, into the concert itself. Because um, I think that from a performance level that, you know, we can keep up with the Joneses anywhere else in the world. Yeah, if, uh, we, uh, we, we utilize video, we utilize high def, we utilize different kinds of things that you normally wouldn't see, I think, in a local performance. But not cellophane hula skirts. Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, if, if that's where you are at the moment and if that's what you're doing, um, and that's fine, yeah. Um, we, we haven't done that. It's not to say that we won't in the future, but right now, no. So you're a traditionalist, but you can see yourself, you don't rule it out in the future doing wacky cellophane hula skirts? I, I, I wouldn't rule it out, but I don't think so. <laughs> I thought so. <laughs> You're just being generous, right? You don't want to criticize the next cool hula. No, nope, no, nope, no, nope. because everybody has a purpose. Everybody has a place in this huge fabric. Yeah, and you put one you pull one thread out and everything unravels. Yeah, so there is value in everything that every kumuhula does, whether you agree with that kumuhula or not. It's it's the entire whole that you have to take a look at. But what is next for you, do you think? I don't know. And that's a good question because I think I never knew. Um, even in, my, in, in, uh, in retrospect, you know, uh, there are certain things that are definite. I know that halal is definite. I know that my family is definite. I know that where I come from is definite. And the, and the, and the community that I associate myself with is there. Um, I think that's, that's it, really. And whatever you do, and I've been lucky in, in my life, and sometimes not, um, you know, that to take whatever 
um, comes your way and roll with it and try see what happens. You know, I'm, I'm known for being able to jump off the cliff and seeing where you can land, or if you land. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes, sometimes you fly, sometimes you crash, you know, and it's okay. Um, but I don't think, I don't know what's next. Uh. <laughs> Stay tuned, right? Yeah, yeah, maybe, yeah, I have no idea. I have no idea, and I think um, maybe if I was in my 20s, I'd be more definite, but um, you know, let's see, I'm 45, and I think that you know, I'm feeling real settled um, with a lot of different things. You know, I think it's time for the next group to start you know, doing stuff, and I see it happening. I see it happening with um, a younger generation of Hawaiian musicians that are um, you know, speaking Hawaiian and singing and, and reviving old songs and writing new songs in the old fashion. You know, so yeah, it, it's it's wonderful to see, and I'm glad to have been a, to be a part of that. Um, of course, constantly learning, creating new challenges, and reinventing himself. Perhaps that's what defines Kaylee Iraichel. I hope you enjoyed getting to know this man who calls himself first and foremost a Hawaiian, who has faced adversity and change and remained true to his roots. Mahalo to Kaylee and to you for joining me for this long story short. I'm Leslie Wilcox. Ahui ho, kako.